Hi, my name is Jonathan Chu, the producer. And I'm Kina Sherman, I'm the creative lead. And this is Batik, a first person 3D action puzzle game. What would you do if you knew the future? Would you change fate? You play as Kairos. Kairos is a clairvoyant Batik. She has the power to change fate. She has the power to write people's fates as well. She discovers a plot to that will doom the human race, and she must stop it now. So there are three different time states that we are using so that you can use um, these mechanics that we will show later on. And they are, it's the present, lapse, and future. Um, the present is where you will start and end all levels. This is where all of your actions will be permanently set. If you do something in the present, it will happen and you can't change that fact. Um, that leads us to the next one. When you want to project into the future, you go through a state of lapse. Lapse is the it gives you the ability to traverse through the world from where you want where you are in the present and where you want to be in the future. And during lapse, the world is rushing past you. People are blurring around you, and the city is living around you. It's a state of non-time in which you can you navigate through this world. In this time, in this state, the world the objects exist in a state of being and non-being. We equate this closest to Schrodinger's cat. In Schrodinger's cat is the theory that a cat exists in both being alive and dead. And this, we, we take this in our world as like having doors. During lapse, they exist in a both state of open and closeness. Um, and our final state is the future. And with this is, this is your final destination when you use your projection. And here is where you're able to interact with the environment and people. However, you are not yourself exactly so much as a force, which means that when you set actions in the future, you can come back to the present. And yeah, you can come back to the present, and that action that you had done in the future is keeping, which means that as you come along to that point in time when the action happened, you will see it happen regardless of whether or not you have done that. And we will explain that in further detail in our mechanics, which is next. So how do you go about saving the world? We've created two mechanics to accomplish this, ghosting and projection. Ghosting is the ability to see the future presence of a targeted individual or object within a certain amount of time in the future. Imagine you're chasing after someone through a crowd. You want to cut them off and you want to intercept them. In order to do this, you have them targeted and you use ghosting. With ghosting, you can see where they'll be 5 to 15 seconds in the future, and you can intercept their path and catch up with them. Our second mechanic is projection, and this is what I mentioned before about where you're able to enter the future. So as you will see here, you will project yourself into the future to have a certain action happen. Uh, say you push someone off their bike. And once that has been keyframed in the future, it can come back to the present, and as time moves along to that point, you will see that action happen, and your previous timeline will no longer be true because you have set that new action, and the new future will happen. Um, so we'll walk you through this demo level. Um, so here we have a, a building to the left where you have to find your target who has uh, documents that you need. And you have to watch out for this guard here who you are currently uh, ghosting, and as you can see the top there's ghosting effect. It's 15 seconds, and you can scrub that back and forth as you need. And here we're waiting for the guard to go, because you saw where he would be if we ghosting. And now you approach the door, because he's left, and you can close it behind you to make sure he doesn't see you now. And here we have your target with the documents. And this is the present, so you can attempt to get the documents there, but he's going to be like, no way, that's, that's not going to happen. So you have to try this again where you're actually in the future. So you project yourself forward and push him over as a, as a force. And then you come back to the present and you'll see that action happen at that moment that you have keyframe, which means that he will fall over and the documents will be on the ground you take. So you have to run because the guards are coming after you and he's screaming like, oh my gosh, someone I tripped over and dropped some. So <laughs> right, like, this is magic. Um, but the guard comes after you so, and this door is locked. So you have to pass through it somehow, otherwise you'll be caught. And you have to lapse and now you're in the future you open the door and close it so that when you are in the present, you can pass through it without any trouble. And then it will close behind you so that the guard cannot follow you. And you are ready to go. Yeah.
So what we want to accomplish with level design is that we want to create spatial temporal puzzles, taking advantage of the location and timing of where objects and people will be within the level. Furthermore, we realize that this kind of mechanics really require a lot of use of resources and assets. So we've been thinking about how can we reuse these kinds of levels. And one thing that's emerged has been through the narrative. Say you're trying to prevent the future from doing the human race. So you fail the first time. And that all occurs to you. And you have to play through this world. And you have different goals as you're going through each of these levels. At, so you can prevent the, prevent the dooming of the human race. This allows us to reuse these levels while extending gameplay. So for aesthetics, we understand um, that there will be a lot of assets, and we want to preemptively um, get that not so much of a problem, because we wanted to have these beautiful painted backgrounds with lots of detail. And what we were thinking was having it so that we use a little bit of accretion and layering, where the artist can make pieces of assets and um, parts of buildings, parts of textures, mix and match them, make combinations, so that you can do a sort of layering effect here, where we have like a poster, a wall, like the piping behind it, and move it around so that we have a bigger possibility for what we can do with environments without sacrificing so much work on the artist's side. Um, so here are some cost of art pieces that we have from our wonderful artists. This is an example of what we want the market and locations to look. Um, on the other hand, we want our characters to be really simple and iconic and really easy to recognize and have exaggerated movements so that we want them to pop out of the environment because the environment will be a little cluttery because we want that feeling of chaos and like you want to look deeper into this world because it has such depth. So what we want to accomplish with this game is we want to create a really fun visual entertainment experience for people. We want people to engage with these levels and engage in these puzzles. And with these puzzles, we want to create multiple solutions, whether it be pushing over your target so you can steal papers, or creating another scenario where he like, spills coffee on himself and he's distracted. Having these different solutions allows you, the player, to play through these levels at how they want to play. Um, this also, we would like to have uh, some diegetic feelings because we wanted to move away from having too much of a HUD and we wanted to have it so that if you want to project into the future, you can use, say, a watch or your hand to look at or, um, or a clipboard or something so that you won't lose track of all these different actions that you're doing. So in terms of scope, what we're aiming to do is we want to implement three levels by the end of next year. We have a narrative laid out, but we want to target which levels we want to do, say, first, third, and fifth, to showcase the mechanics in the, at their best way. So in terms of breaking down what we feel are most important in the technical challenges of what we are facing for this game, we've broken it down into AI and graphics. So when it comes to generating what the world will be when you're in the future, it, it, uh, it says AI, it screams AI. So the, what, the way that we're thinking about this is we're going to use a rule-based system. Given the state of the world and given the states of all the characters within this, you can generate what the future will hold. Furthermore, for graphics, one of the most important things that we feel is giving distinct look for when you go into laps and into future. In the prototype, the, the colors of the world change. We wanted to we want to create these cool shaders that hypersaturate colors of the world in order to give the distinct feel of being in the future. Because of this, we want to use UDK. UDK has a really powerful graphics engine that allows to do all these cool shader techniques with it. So in terms of a rough production plan of what we want to do, during the summer we want to develop the pipelines for each of our teams. How our artists will be working, will they be using Dropbox or Google Docs? And in the fall we want to implement our core mechanics of ghosting and projection. And, in this, and build out a single level. And in the spring, we want to continue to, with the systems that we've implemented and continue to build out more levels. And this is our current team. We're at about 15 people with three industry advisors. Um, all of our artists are from USC, and most of our team is at USC. Uh, one person, we actually had a composer contact us from who wants to make music for a game. And that's our game.
any of you guys have experience uh, in Final Games, and how many of you guys have experience, um, particularly YouTube, producing any of Well, in terms of experience with Final Games, we have, like, Kina, she's worked on, um, on Quicksilver and a little bit of Forest Walker. And we, so our team is a little bit, doesn't have as much experience on Final Games, but we have a lot of people who are really resourceful in, like, in terms of classes and coding ability and design ability. We have, like, our engineers have taken AI, so they know, like, how to implement the systems that we want to go for. And in terms of graphics, like, those kinds of shaders. And in terms of, Leadership, I feel that, well, for me personally, I'm going to, well, I'm going off to go be a program manager intern to go, like, learn the production process and being able to learn how to lead a team properly. Yeah. Um, this actually reminds me, of the, pro the design problem that you set out reminds me very strongly of the misadventures of PB Winterbottom. Um, in terms of the feedback problems I think you're going to face. And I don't see any focus on your team in terms of usability and a, a strong focus on UI. You mentioned not wanting a HUD. I actually think you're going to rethink that. Um, and I think you need someone who's focused in on that feedback cycle because it's a very, very complex problem. And right now your demo is actually more confusing than it is illuminating. Um, so, right now we are actually looking for UI designers and usability um, people. So that is something we, we definitely understand that there are going to be a lot of problems with uh, design and having fairs understanding the mechanic. But I think we can get through it because as we have been talking with a lot of people and trying to see what their input is on our design, it seems that once people understand it, then they start thinking, oh, I, I think like this is what the possibilities are. And we kind of want to go along that of epiphany where you're like, oh, this is really cool, as opposed to it being so complicated and confusing. So we're working on that right now. Um, so your mechanics seem pretty complicated, but your gameplay puzzles that you've laid out seem pretty simple. Have you thought about trying to invert that, where you have more complex puzzles, but a simple mechanic that people can grasp earlier on? Yeah, I think um, at this point we were considering having it so that in the beginning we only have one mechanic laid out for them and then switch it off to the second one and then later on have it as both because it's it does seem a little overwhelming to have all of these possibilities open. And at, at the same time, we have kind of a, a skill scoping layout that we're trying to work out. Um, so quick question regarding, so at the end of the day, it has to be demo to demo day. Are you guys at all concerned about, you know, a player understanding the mechanic in that 30 seconds to two minutes they're going to have at your booth? Um, I think that we can make a level that does showcase something fairly simply, and it may come down to how well we present that level or how we want to present the tutorial aspect of it. But I, I do think it's a viable thing. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, since you guys have a lot of like possibilities to solve a problem, then will there be multiple endings that you guys are thinking of, or or how are we going to keep track of all the possibilities that might happen in the game? Um, so that is something that we were definitely looking into because we understand that with more and more options, the more intense and like it's going to go insane. So we were going to make it so that you have one or two ways around it because scope-wise, we can only really do maybe A, D, and then maybe have two endings at the most because it will take a lot of time in trying to get all these aspects done. We just really want the puzzles to be fun overall. One last question. Uh, so let me see if I can get this right. Your your game is a first person stealth puzzle, essentially. Um, I guess you could add stealth if you wanted to. Well, it sounds. I mean, it sounds like you're trying to use these mechanics to like sneak around and like find these key figures that you want to. Um, yeah, right now, yeah, right now, stealth. It, it kind of feels like ghosting is one of those stealthy mechanics, but that's only the current iteration of what we've done. We want to expand more because we don't want to be limited and just you have to sneak around and do everything passively. We kind of want to see it. 
So so what so what is your game like essentially going like what are you aiming for then? Uh, something a little more fast paced. So maybe a fast paced puzzle where you're trying to solve these. Um, you want to go through laps and teach your match to the present quickly because you only want short time limits, maybe like ten seconds, fifteen seconds max. So you're able to shuffle through these uh, different states and get all these different things out. Alright, I'll recommend that you come up with kind of like a like a very like quick one sentence that you can say that describes your game to the level of like gameplay and everything so that there's not this much confusion over the mechanics and what you're trying to go for with the game. Yeah, thank you.